This podcast is presented by Shot, with over 130 years of experience delivering innovative, high-quality products. Shot is the global leader in specialty glass, glass ceramics, and other innovative materials. With a direct presence in over 30 countries, the company is a highly skilled partner for several high-tech industries, including defense, semiconductors, data communications, optics, energy, automotive, aerospace, and healthcare. One of Shot's key goals is environmental protection corporate-wide, and it is committed to being the first specialty glass manufacturer in the world to be climate neutral by 2030. Thank you again to our sponsors at SHOT for helping us present this podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Emerging Tech Horizons podcast. I'm Mark Lewis, the Executive Director of NDIA's Emerging Technologies Institute. And today's podcast will focus on what the DoD can learn from the commercial sector in how to use its data, including some best practices. This is obviously an important issue, and especially important here at NDIA, since we've been doing workshops and software modernization, data sharing, and condition-based maintenance, and doing other work in data analytics. So uh, to learn more about that, please visit our website and our YouTube page to see these activities and more. My guest today to help explore this issue is Colin Carroll, head of federal and defense business at Applied Intuition. Before Applied Intuition, Colin was the chief operations officer at the Department of Defense's Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, the JAKE, which is the organization, organization charged with transforming the U.S. military through artificial intelligence and automation. Uh, Colin graduated from the United States Naval Academy with a degree in aerospace engineering. He was commissioned in the United States Marine Corps as a ground intelligence officer. He spent six years on active duty leading a reconnaissance platoon and company and served as a staff intelligence officer for a Marine Corps infantry battalion. After leaving active duty, Colin graduated from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. He joined the Department of Defense as a federal civilian where he spent five years working on hard intelligence and information problems in the Pacific theater. In 2017, he became a Plank member of of Project Maven, the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security's premier artificial intelligence capability development project, and he acted as the Deputy for Engineering Integration for Maven. He transitioned to the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab and was a technical project manager for a major program at the Jake called Smart Sensor, which was a high-endurance autonomous intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance platform. In 2020, he returned to federal service as the Jake's inaugural chief operations officer, and we got the overlap in the Pentagon during that time. So, Colin, again, great to see you. Thanks for being on the podcast, and I'll ask our audience to wel- to join me and welcome you uh, on uh, Emerging Tech Horizons. Yeah, Mark, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Okay. So, so uh, uh, Colin, first I want to jump in. We, 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 I would love to learn more about you. I mean, I, I you know, I, I went through your biography. Good. Could you tell us a little bit more about your background and how you wind up wound up back in you know first first obvious marine, but then back in the department and now uh, 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 left the department uh, in in uh, in 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 the private sector? Yeah, that's easy, Mark. Uh, so I went to Naval Academy. I was an aerospace engineer. I really wanted to fly. I was medically disqualified, so uh, they made me go into the Marine Corps ground. At the time, 2007, nobody wanted to be a Marine Corps ground officer because Fallujah 2 was going on. This is 2007. The Marine, Corps, the Marine Corps would take anybody, so they gave me a waiver. Um, and I did my <laughs> they, will take any, they will not take anybody, but go ahead. <laughs> as long as you're not colorblind, you're basically good. So, uh, yeah, I did my five and a half years um, active duty. I'm still technically in the reserves. Um, and, yeah, I uh, did five years there, five years kind of after that, doing some – um, intelligence work, and then uh, a, f- a friend and colleague, Colonel Drew Kukor, called me out of the blue in 2017 and said, "Hey, Bob, we just established this new thing called Project Maven. Do you want to come and run the counterintelligence effort for Maven?" And what I learned when I got there on day one was they all basically had a, a PowerPoint slide and a memo, and uh, they needed actual like, systems integration engineering work, and so that's what I ended up doing. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, so I got into it. So, can you tell us also a little bit about um, the, your work at the Jake? How did that How did that come about? Was that a direct result of Project Maven? It was it follow on. Yeah. Yeah, it was General Jack Shanahan was the um, director of warfighter support at USDINS. So Maven fell under him. Um, basically, when he left to go run the Jake, he asked if I could come over and help him out. 
I went to Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. At the end of the day, I'm a, I'm a true believer in autonomy. AI is a, is a large part of autonomy when it comes to perception. But I really wanted to go run autonomy programs, and so I went with them to the jig. Excellent, excellent. Um, so, if we could, let's let's dive right in. Right in. Um, do you see commercially derived technologies as being increasingly viable? In some cases, so superior alternatives to some of the traditional platforms and systems. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, when I was at Maven in the jig, I worked heavily with commercial companies. Um, and I did a mix, Maven was mostly commercial. At the Jake, it was a mix of your traditional defense contractors, uh, kind of non-traditional commercial companies, and then your UARCs and FFRDCs. And I worked at a UARC and FFRDC. I've worked at a large traditional defense contractor as well. So I'm, I've kind of seen the, the spectrum of what's out there. Um, I do think that uh, commercial plays a, a special part in delivering technology to the warfighter. I think that there's a, there's a spectrum, right? So in some cases, you know, what commercial brings, especially your non-traditional commercial companies, your venture capital backed startups is massive investment from the venture community, uh, a lot of reps and, and user feedback on the software itself from, you know, commercial users. And there's a, there's a definitely a, a part of the uh, pie chart where commercial technologies plugs right in. A lot of this is actually less on like the what I consider like the war fighting capability side and more on the kind of back office administrative side. So, you know, what JP Morgan Chase or Wells Fargo uses when it when it uh, revolutionizes how it does business is actually very similar to what the department needs on the on like the accounting and, and you know travel claims side. I think uh, the interesting so so that to me is like one one place where Commercial technology can just plug right in. The problems are the same. The data is the same. Um, on the warfighter side, it's a little it's a little trickier. Most of the software that you know other sectors are using does not readily apply to uh, you know what a warfighter needs when it comes to command and control or targeting or intelligence. So it, it you know that's the place where you take technology that's been built, uh, been funded by you know venture or other private private investors, and then you have to modify it and tweak it. Typically, it has to touch government data. That's where the modification is coming in place. Then it's applied to a different use case. Um, I think that the limiting factor between commercial or traditional defense or your your government uh, software developers or potentially your FRECs is who has access to the data. So government data is traditionally um, more inaccessible to the commercial sector because it's sensitive or it's classified, and uh, and so not, you know commercial technologies aren't always as as immediately applicable or readily recognizable as applicable to government uh, government problems. So there so there are actually are actually times when frankly the commercially derived technologies could be inferior to government systems or. Yeah, you know, I've, I've got a story. We work with the Army here, uh, dealing with the Army Program Office. So the Army Program Office is fielding a major uh, defense acquisition program. It's a it's a vehicle. Uh, he's, you know, the PM's got a choice between looking at what's being built in industry for perception, so uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, text and classification, computer vision models for like a tank turret. He's got a, he's got a, looking at hey, what is commercial done? He's talking to some of the vendors that make. AI ML technologies for Maven. And then he's looking at what the Army does. C5 ISR, the Army has a program called Atlas. And if you talk to the Atlas team, the Atlas team will say, we've got the best tech. It's the best AI ML models. We did it at convergence. No one can beat us. I think the reality is the C5 ISR team has access to all the government data. And therefore, their model is you know super, super performant. What nobody actually knows, what the PM doesn't know is if you gave that data, uh, if you gave access to that data to your commercial companies that are doing things like Maven or other companies and ran a, you know, an actual experiment to say, hey, with a gold standard data set, let's test 10 models against that and see who actually performs. Right now, there's no way to do that. So everybody just runs around saying, I've got the best thing. I've got the best thing. And the reality is, you know, None of these teams actually want to be tested because none of them want to be put up to the standard of 
hey, let's see who is actually better. And we can talk about how Maven and the Jake ran some of these competitions to actually determine, you know, who is better in which to design domain, et cetera. Yeah, actually, I'd, I'd love, I'd love to, I'd love to uh, poke at that because you know, I, I think, I think it's it's widely accepted that data is the key to making these technologies work. Uh, but but it seems like many of the programs in, in the DoD have frankly been been unable to capitalize on on this you know treasury of data that they have. So I, I'd love to hear about your experiences at uh, Project Maven and the Jake, and what did you learn about how the department uses its data, and and maybe some some uh, best practices. Oh man, um, you know I always start when people ask about data in the government. I always start by saying, well, if we're lucky, the government actually saved this data, which is. Uh, which is not always the case, right? Um, and when it, and when the government does save its data, it sometimes does ridiculous things with it. So, so my kind of baseline is for for AI programs where data is really important, whether that's a perception or a natural language processing, you know, looking at a generative AI like ChatGPT three, applying that to the department's data, um, or if it's a perception problem like an ISR problem where you're looking at camera data or radar data. Uh, I have a couple rules. These are my government government hat column rules. One is uh, the government state is the most valuable thing that it owns. A lot of times it doesn't know that. And so it either doesn't collect it or it does collect it, but it kind of sits in uh, you know, an MRE box on a hard drive, which I've seen, by the way. Uh, or, or potentially even worse, it takes its data and it gives it to industry. And now I'm here in industry, like if the government wants to give me its data, I'll take it all day long. But a best practice would be bring industry to the data. Don't just hand it over. Because what industry winds up doing is they'll, they'll build something with your data and then they'll go down to the program office three doors down on the left in the same hallway that you're in and they'll sell that back to that program office. So the government winds up paying for the same thing multiple times. So I think, uh, you know, maintaining, so storing the data, making it available at enterprise level, we can talk a little bit about the stories I've got there as well. Uh, and then actually bringing, uh, bringing industry or whichever performer to the data is probably the best practice. The last thing I'll say is uh, because data is so valuable, all your, all your developers are going to know, hey, I need the data. I can make a cool mock-up with a little bit of data, but to actually make a performant autonomous system or AI model, I need um, access to large quantities of data so my, my model can perform in you know, a wide variety of design domains. Um, they're all going to, they're all going to uh, want to come to the data, but then be able to be judged kind of independently and, and fairly based on what they deliver. That way the government can actually go, okay, I've got 10 different people doing work here. Hey, here are the top two, here are the, kind of the middle, here are the bottom two, we'll cut the bottom two. And I feel like that doesn't typically happen with what we've seen. Interesting. You you promised us some good stories, by the way. <laughs> yeah, like so, I'll, I'll tell yeah. you. So when I say enterprise data, I got a really good example of this. When I was at, so I came from Maven. I helped build the data enterprise at Maven. Uh, we learned a lot of lessons at Maven. Maven was a bunch of marine reservists that did all sorts of things that were not artificial intelligence before we came to Maven. Uh, we made some mistakes early, but we learned. We listened to our commercial uh, develop development teams, and we learned. Um, maybe maybe slower than they wanted to, but we did learn. Uh, but we built a, a great data set. This is an ISR data set. So this is camera data. This is radar data, uh, unclassified and classified. When I got to the Jake, I moved to the Jake. Jack Shanahan moved to the Jake. You would think that Maven, a geospatial AI intelligence program, and the Jake, the Artificial Intelligence Center for the Joint Force, would share data sets. The reality is, the reality is data, it's such an emotional thing for people. Like, hey, this is my data. I have, I have built my data set. Then in, even in the department where you're working on very similar problems, we couldn't, we at the Jake couldn't get access to the Maven data. So the fact that like some of us knew more about the data than the, the current people at Maven, they wouldn't share it with us, wouldn't share it with us. And, and so that, that's, uh, I see this all the time, even now on an industry side looking, looking at the department. But I've also seen it within, you know, stovepipes at the same automotive OEM, for example. So someone that we support on the commercial side at Ford, like this Ford team doesn't want to share its data with this other Ford team. So it's just, a, I think it's just like a, a human nature thing. Like I, I know it's valuable. I've got it. It's mine. 
if I give it to somebody else, they might they might use it, and then the resulting technology might be better than the one I'm building. So nobody, no one's really, you know, it's like empires instead of like, hey, we all just want to beat China, so let's just make the best thing possible and make it widely available. I don't. Yeah, see absolutely. No, yeah, yeah. Knowledge, knowledge is power, isn't it? So yeah, yeah. Um, so, so it sounds like you've got some ideas on better data management for the DoD <laughs> based on some of your experiences. Yeah, I think uh, the fear about data kind of escaping to industry or escaping to the adversaries is a valid fear. I think I think that for like use cases, I, I have an autonomous vehicle, ground vehicle. You know, DARPA's got a program, Army Research Lab's got a program. The Army AI2C up in Pittsburgh's got a program. There's a bunch of program offices, PEOs in the Army that have programs. They all have very similar mobility data problems. They're all collecting data. In my mind, the right answer would be create an enterprise data management platform on a government network, unclassified, classified, up to SCI if you're talking about that, that level of data, and then enable everybody in the department that's doing that kind of work access to that data to include industry to come in if they're on contract. Right now, what we've seen is all those different programs that I mentioned have all stovepipe little data efforts. So it would be like if you went to Ford and you said, hey, the Ford you know, focus team is doing something different than the Ford expedition team. It's doing something different from the Ford Explorer team. And none of them are ever actually sharing, even understanding what's going on. So I think for the department to move forward, they need to, they need to go to that enterprise model. And you know, the, the major issue is you know, Congress appropriates money, authorizes program officers to do a thing. They look at it with their very narrow mindset of this is my thing. I have money to do my thing. No one's thinking, hey, I'm going to spend some of my money to help out like the next guy or the guy, you know, three doors down or, or over at Army Research Lab. So it's kind of this like tragedy of the commons problem where nobody wants to fund and build this enterprise thing. And that's, I don't know how to get there. I'm not, you know, everybody recognizes it's a problem, but I'm not seeing it right now. I got some ideas, but... I don't want. I don't want to get ahead of. Con I don't want to get ahead of Congress and, and give some of my ideas out here on the podcast. But we'll see. I think you'll be seeing some interesting things here in the twenty four NDA. Excellent. And then we've got a, We've got a topic for a follow on podcast with you as after the, the NDA comes out. Definitely. So so, uh, uh, okay. So government in, in general is struggling with data, and there are obviously some. You 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 highlight some problems that both government and industry have stove piping. What can the private sector teach the government? And are there best practices that we can take out of the private sector and apply them to the government? Oh, man. I mean, so from a technical perspective, I think uh, having a foundational data management platform upon which your entire DevSecOps pipeline for software is built is something that we can learn. We, we the government, can learn from private sector. Um, you know, a really good example of this is the the Tesla maglev NVIDIA drive environment where, you know, Elon basically is rapidly making and testing software and pushing up to production uh, based on, you know, a 10,000 labeler annotation force, a lot of live driving, collecting data, a lot of synthetic data for, for um, edge use cases. Like the DoD doesn't have anything set up like that for even a single program, not to mention, you know, multiple vehicles using uh, using a, a foundational data management platform. So in my mind, like understanding how some of these autonomy programs uh, design their programs would be really key. That's specific to autonomy, but the, you, pull, you pull the perception part of autonomy out, apply it to other aspects of AI ML. Chat GPT-3 and OpenAI is a similar similar uh, platform if you look at that but i yeah i mean the department's never going to be resourced enough to rebuild something like tesla's uh development platform with right, right, billions right. of dollars just on that one platform right so, and tens of thousands of people yeah, yeah so i think the question yeah. is how, how do you leverage some of the commercial capability that's got yeah, had that investment but then Bring it into a government environment and then put the government data in it, make it accessible. What I think, what I think, you know, my, my biggest fear is it always was in the department, it still is now here, is looking at some of these programs and saying, oh, here we go. They're just gonna take three years and try and rebuild something that already exists with a lot less money and probably less talented engineers. So you're gonna wind up with 
you know, a, a lesser product at the end of the day. Yeah. And of course, you know, I think about the competition with China and I think about the number of people they can deploy to labeling and the amount of data that they have, and especially given their less restrictive privacy concerns, uh, it, it, it seems like quite a challenge, not just to keep up with industry, but obviously to keep up with a peer competitor. Am I on the right track there? Or is that, yeah. is that a fair statement? Or? We, used to, we had an argument on Friday this week, actually here in the office, about Chinese data labelers. And it was, you know, hey, with synthetic data, do, do we need these labelers or not? I'll tell you, Elon's got 10,000 labelers at Tesla that are like on the workforce. You know, do you know what the biggest AIML uh, labeling team in DoD is? Just curious. I I wouldn't even venture a guess. Yeah, it's about 250 labelers. They're Maven labelers between unclassified and classified, and they're full-time labelers. They do eight hours a day. 250, that's the largest. If you look at every other AIML program in the department or program that's using uh, you know imagery for perception purposes, it's mostly like interns in the back. A couple of them maybe have contract. I'm dead serious. Like they come in the summertime. Maybe there's some like military labelers. You mentioned China. The Maven, uh, Maven had a hoodie made. So it was a great article. It was probably 2018 Time Magazine where there's a there's a uh, like a photo going down this huge warehouse. It's on the front page of New York Times, and it's like a Chinese data labeling factory, probably for their you know security cameras. And uh, then if you go and you know open up like, page ten, there's a great photo of a guy turned around with a hoodie. And his hoodie, and I, I'm not I'm not allowed to curse here, so maybe you'll edit this part out. But his hoodie says, <laughs> his hoodie says "dope shit" on the front of it, and it's like the Supreme <laughs> letters, like the the company Supreme. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, there's yeah. this article about hey Chinese day labeling. So Maven actually had a, a hoodie made that said "dope shit" on the front, and it says something like "Beijing 2020 Spring Break" or something like that <laughs> on the back of it. That was our shirt. So you know, yeah, I mean the. China can just get labor for such lower cost, um, and they've got great technology. So my guess is that China has hundreds of millions of labeled frames. I think the difference between China and the Department of Defense when it comes to data is that we actually have 20 plus years of data from, uh, from conflict. Now, our conflict is Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Somalia. It's not Ukraine, it's not the South China Sea, but we have quite a bit of data coming off of our platforms, whereas China doesn't actually have this data. They've got a lot of data on their own people, but not a lot of data from you know, deployed, uh, deployed platforms in conflict. So that's an edge that we have. I'm not sure that the department really understands this, but that's a huge edge that we have. Uh, the Air Force seems to take advantage of this, like they're storing their data, especially from their intelligence platforms. A lot of, a lot of the rest of that data just it never makes it off the vehicle, or if it does, it uh, doesn't make it to an enterprise place where developers can use it. But that's uh, that's actually a profound insight, though, because I, I I frequently hear people refer. I mean, they they view China as being ten feet tall, and and that's clearly one area where they're not. So that leads to my, my my last question for you, which is, you know, we we talk about the need for data sharing, but that's often at odds with the need for data security. And, and related to that, uh, privacy concerns and the rights of companies to keep their own technical data and IP. So how do you strike that balance? How do you share data, preserve security, keep privacy and IP rights all juggled and, and, and managed? Yeah. The data that I've been talking about today is primarily government-owned data. And it's like, it's like sensor data. So it's something coming off a platform or it's command and control data. It's diagnostic data. Um, we haven't been talking about like what I would consider to be like technical data from a data assertions and IP perspective, which is design data or uh, vendor-owned, industry-owned data around the platform. I think there's like a whole set of laws and policies regarding that data. But when it comes to when it comes to um, uh, software technical IP, so hey, this is my neural net with my trained weights and biases, something that I've spent a lot of money on in industry. Um, you'll see the industry, a lot of times they don't, they don't want to bring that technical data to a government environment because they don't trust it. But the interesting thing is, you know, an Amazon like 
AWS enclave that is FedRAMP out for uh, that they just like spin up on their own. So GovCloud versus one that's GovCloud but managed by a government uh, authorizing official. I mean, it's, it's the same exact cloud. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. So I think what we've seen in the last three or four years is people becoming more industries becoming more comfortable bringing their technical IP to a government network, um, as long as there's access control and stuff like that in place. Uh, I think the other thing that we're seeing is government is being more cautious with their data, so that instead of just handing data over to a to a performer, so that they put it on their corporate networks. Now I'm talking about like government owned sensor data. They're actually putting it into a government environment and then onboarding, you know, industry to that environment. Um, in my mind, the right answer to understand who makes the best technology is uh, access to the same data sets. So there's a couple ways you could do it, right? One is you just get a kind of sample of data and hand it to industry. So everybody gets the same sample. The other is you, you onboard industry to your kind of test sandbox where you've got your sample data or even or even your full data set if it's the right environment, and you let everybody train the same models on that data. Um, Maven did it this way, right? Maven had a kind of a bake-off with multiple vendors doing the same thing with the same data. In other places I've seen people try to do like a, like a sandbox. Army Research Lab, for example, does one where they bring in, in uh, sorry, universities primarily. Um, R&E right now has this concept called uh, AI hubs, so AI hubs. I think there's three of them that have been funded in 2023, but that's primarily for research and engineering. So it's primarily for universities and like UARCs and less so for industry. But I think the same concept could apply where you bring industry in, all the data is on a government network, you bring everybody in. And then at the end, you have a test regime, a test framework set up so that you can evaluate Say okay, this is the best model out of the, the hundred performers. This is the one that's going to deploy forward to the warfighter. All right. So there's there's ways to do it. Right. No, Colin, that makes a lot of sense, and hopefully we've got some folks listening from R and E on this podcast, and they they can implement the suggestion. So, Colin, we've about run out of time. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for joining us. Let me also thank our audience for tuning in. Um, if I can, I want to take a, a moment to highlight uh, ETI will be uh, hosting our upcoming Emerging Technologies for Defense Conference and Exhibition. Uh, it's going to be held at the JW Marriott this summer, August 28th through 30th. Uh, please look for more information on our website. And as always, look, for, look to our website for other podcasts and other uh, research uh, products being uh, generated by NDIA's Emerging Technologies Institute. Colin. Thank you again for joining us. Fascinating conversation. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks, Mark.